Hello, I'm Karen McNeil, and this is WineSpeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most important and fascinating people in the wine business. And today we're speaking with Hugh Johnson, who is, of course, one of the world's best-selling wine writers, known for the World Atlas of Wine and his annual Pocket Wine Book, both first published in the 1970s. And I think for, if I counted in correctly in his biography, 25 other groundbreaking books, including the remarkable The Story of Wine. After graduating with a degree in English literature from King's College at Cambridge, Johnson became feature writer for Condé Nast magazines, including Vogue and House and Garden. He went on to write and edit for Gourmet, The New York Times, The Sunday Times, and The World of Fine Wine, among other publications. In addition to books on wine, he has published multiple award-winning best-selling books on horticulture, including the International Book of Trees and the Principles of Gardening. Hugh Johnson was Decanter's Man of the Year in 1995 and was awarded France's Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérité in 2003 and in 2007 was named an Officer of the Order of the British Empire for services to winemaking and horticulture. Hugh Johnson, welcome. Thank you, Karen, it's good to see you. Wonderful to see you. You know, I want to start a bit with your own history. I'm curious if you were raised in a family that drank wine. Yes, in a way that middle-class families, you know, on the sort of doctor, lawyer level, uh, did, you know, um, traditionally in, in England, that was, uh, they, they didn't particularly drink great wine, but they, we drank wine regularly. We, we would always, there would, there would be sherry and there would be claret. And I remember my father's favourite chateau, which he bought regularly from our wonderful wine society, um, which was Chateau Les Hommes de Pez. Uh, Les now a, a name to conjure with. In those days, just another croup bourgeois. Right. Wow. Very interesting. So was there then, um, it sounds like wine was, you know, sort of just around. Was there a kind of aha moment when you said to yourself, oh, wait a minute, wine is a lot more interesting than... There was, just... actually, yes. I mean, it, it, <laughs> I think you probably could ask that of any... Uh, Wine lover, and they said, "Yes, that was the bottle." Um, Jancis, my great friend and colleague, always quotes Chambon Musigny Les Amoureuses, uh, and I think it was the name that got her actually. The <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, to me, it was it was when I was at Cambridge University, and uh, I shared a set of rooms with a friend who was very keen on wine and a very good taster, and he came back from a rather sort of smart black tie dinner late one night and I was in our rooms sort of pretending to work I expect and he's, he, he was not exactly sober I'll put it that way and he, he produced two glasses of red wine and he said you taste these and tell me anything about them and I did and I said well this one is just red wine and this one is extraordinary I've never had anything like it and they were, in fact, two red burgundies from Verne Romanet, and one was a DRC wine. I didn't know anything about DRC in those days. The other one definitely wasn't. Uh, and he said, well, they grow you know, a few hundred yards apart, and this is what they're like. And I mean, in a way, you could see that the world atlas of wine became inevitable after that. <laughs> My goodness, to uh, be sitting in your college dorm room and have someone, a friend, bring you a glass of Domaine de la Romani Conti. I, I don't know, it didn't happen to me in college, Hugh, but... Well, uh, we were very, very spoiled because um, in the way that uh, British society worked or did work, it was pretty obvious that the students at uh, Oxford and Cambridge universities were grown up to be the leaders of the country. You know, they were going to be influential people. So where did the um, wine merchants concentrate their efforts? And they used to bring us tastings. I mean, we had fantastic wine tastings. And that was uh, the first time I tasted California wine was at the age of 
maybe 19, in, in our college rooms, where there was enthusiastic, a wonderful German wine merchant called Otto Loeb, who had been to California because he got such good clients in, around the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very keen on Moselle wines, particularly in those days. And this, again, was the kind of doctor, lawyer, dentist class. And, um, and he came over, and they gave him a tasting, and he was blown away by the California wines. And he brought back, we must have been the first students in England ever to taste. Well, in those days, it would be Louis Martini, Inglenook, um, that kind of uh, Charles Krug. Uh, the Italian Swiss colony, now I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and the Christian brothers, almost equally forgotten. <laughs> yes, Christian brothers and Italian Swiss colony were, were California's Matus and Lancers, in a sense. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, Hugh, you know, for me, uh, and I think for um, thousands of your other readers, your, your writing is as close to poetry as wine writing gets. Um, and I know a thing or two about how hard it is to write well about wine. How, does it, how did it come to pass that you write so beautifully? Were you a naturally gifted writer? Yeah, I love words. And uh, I studied, I mean, what I studied at university was English literature. And I had a, an inspired uh, tutor. He was a chap who started the Royal Shakespeare Company and, and, and really brought up actors like John Gielgud and I mean, a lot of the famous names. Um, so I was in an, a world of words. <laughs> so yes, I, I just, I've always loved writing. I mean, it's all I'm, it's the only thing I'm qualified to do on the Karen. Well, what, what actually, though, were your plans upon graduation from Cambridge? Was, was I don't think you were initially planning on going into wine. No, um, no, what happened was I was looking for anything where I could get paid for writing, anything would do. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a sort of cup reporter on the daily paper because they don't do a writing, they just report. Um, so I was terribly lucky to get a job with Condé Nast on Vogue magazine as a feature writer. Well, it was a stroke of extraordinary luck to write to be published at the age of 21 or something. Yeah. Just extraordinary. And uh, I was writing about things I knew very little about, of course, as young journalists always do. <laughs> and um, I said to the editor one day, I can't contribute a lot in the way of sort of women's fashion and things like that, but what, why don't you try an article about mine? And she said, yeah, and that was, it came out in the Christmas issue of uh, English Vogue in 1960, however long ago that is. Um, and uh, you, you'll never guess the subject, what to drink with turkey. <laughs> 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 and I didn't know the answer, of course. So I did uh, the obvious journalistic thing. I, I, looked up uh, a few well-known connoisseurs in those days and I got in touch with them and said, what are you going to drink? And they came up with things like, oh, well, Chateau Margot 1959 or <laughs> Musigny or something. I'm completely, by today's standards, out of reach. But actually, I mean, when I look at the prices that I had to quote in that article, I don't believe them. You know, mm. just about, it would be about sort of $2.50. Oh my goodness, unbelievable. <laughs> well, you know, it does, uh, as you're speaking, it's, it's occurring to me, of course, that when you started writing about wine, um, the wine industry was, was a very different um, industry. Uh, what, what was the state of wine writing back then? Well, um, I had there was a long-lived school of uh, rather, mainly rather snobby sort of accounts of great lunches and dinners and things like that. Sometimes very well written and very perceptive. I mean, uh, and then there was this wonderful character called André Simon. André was a Frenchman uh, who'd come to England at the end of, very end of the 19th century, believe it or not, in 1890 something. 
married the daughter of the editor of a local newspaper in Southampton because he wanted to write. And uh, he, uh, he, in the end, he wrote a hundred and something books, mostly about wine. And he, he started wine education, there's no question. Up to that, you had no idea how ignorant wine, the wine, wine merchants were. I mean, they, they were friends with their principals, their suppliers. Uh, they knew nobody else, <laughs> and they didn't ask any searching questions at all. They just said, well, you know, port is port, it's good vintage, <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, and Andre realised this, and he started, I think, called the Wine Trade Club in London before the First World War, believe it or not. I mean, we're going way, way back. Mm. And uh, he started doing lectures. And that is, is without on a clear line of ancestry, that is the beginning of the Institute of Masters of Wine, which is now international, which people know about. That started with Andre. And um, <clears throat> he was a wonderful character. He was a big, burly, sort of uh, rough voiced peasanty type in a way, but gentle and sweet. And he spoke in. Maurice Chevalier sort of accent, uh, very French he was, uh, <laughs> but uh, he took me on to, to help him with his little magazine, Wine and Food, at the age of 23, I think, and then he was getting old, very old, in the late 80s, I guess, he, um, he wanted to see Australia, a pretty amazing for a chap in his late 80s, and so he wanted somebody to take care of his Wine and Food Society, as it then was in London, and take care of his little quarterly magazine, Wine and Food. And he, he managed to sell it to Condé Nast, because the chairman of Condé Nast was a chap called Harry Oxall, who was very keen on Burgundy, wrote a little book about Burgundy. And uh, Andre persuaded Harry to take him on. And Harry looked around and he saw this young chap, Johnson, working in, in Vogue and House and Garden, and he said, you've written an article about wine, why don't you do it? So I became the editor of Wine and Food magazine while Andre went to Australia um, and wrote a book about it. And then, believe it or not, uh, he came back from Australia and he said, you've no idea how good the wine can be there. And nobody knew, nobody talked about it. If any Australian wine was exported, it was called Hearty Burgundy, or well, no, that's a California name, but it, it would be called Burgundy or Port. And I mean, um, and uh, he said he wrote about this book, published in about 1963, um, which goes quite deep into Australian wine. And then, having come back and having relished this and written a jolly good book, he decided to do the same for New Zealand. Now, when you think about it, New Zealand wine didn't exist in those days, but he still wanted no, to find out. Yeah. And he was my patron. He started me going. How fantastic. What, a, uh, what an incredible story. You know, thinking about writing as a way of communicating a wine's, not just quality, but a wine's character um, and the context in which it's drunk, I'm wondering, um, you know, because you were well into wine writing at the, at the time that people began scoring wine numerically with points, I'm wondering what your reaction to that was. It, it, was, it had to have been a, a very um, jarring idea. Yes, um, I didn't understand it at all. I still don't really, because I couldn't do it myself. So I don't know how other people do. No, it, it, what happened precisely was that my New York editor at Simon & Schuster, who also published P.G. Woodhouse, my favorite author, <laughs> um, was a guy called Dan Green. And he, actually he left Simon & Schuster, or no, he was doing a book of mine, I can't remember which one it was, it must have been about 1978. And he showed me a manuscript and he said, um, have a look at this, it's a new wine writer. What do you think? And I read it and I thought, this is terrific writing. Um, you know, very vivid, very sort of punchy and expressive. Uh, and uh, 
I didn't know who it was. And I looked in the margin and he had the vintages, you know, 1966 or something. And then there was a, a figure after it, like 92 or something. I said, well, that's not a vintage, what's that? Oh, that's the score. And I said, score? You can't score wine. Well, how can you possibly score wine any more than you could score a, a piece of music? To me, uh, it, it's just, where do you start? You improve. You start at a hundred and go, no, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and so I've always, you know, Parker was obviously the author of this book. It was his first uh, actual book after The Wine Advocate, I think. Um, and I said to Dan, Dan, well, you know, I'm sure there's a market for that, but uh, I still don't know how he does the score. And 50-something uh, years uh, later, I'm no wiser. I mean, all my colleagues, all wine writers can score, seem to be able to score. They always add scores, but where they get them from, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it is, it's so counterintuitive if you spend an awful lot of time thinking carefully about the words that you're going to use to then give some, the reader a device so that they actually don't even have to read your words. <laughs> is, uh, you know, exactly, exactly. It's, it's it a makes short a writer part. kind of sad. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I put it stronger than that. I think, you know, I love wines and different wines in different ways. And, you know, would you score your friends? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, probably not. Well, back to um, your writing. Uh, your first book, Wine, uh, was published, I think, within six or seven years of your, your graduating uh, from, from Cambridge. Um, how, did, how did that book come about? Because it's, it's hard to get a book contract. And here you, you had a contract. You were still relatively... Uh, yes, I, I, I just, just got married. Hmm. Uh, Judy and I had just got married in 1965. And I'd left, given up paid employment to my father-in-law's horror. Um, I'd left Conte Nast. And uh, I was actually writing for the Sunday Times. I'd managed to get the job of wine correspondent for the Sunday Times, which I was really enjoying. And I, so I looked around among, among the wine books, of which there were, you know, not a few. Uh, Alexis Lachine was one of the best books of the time. Um, and I thought, well, there isn't a book that really explains to me what fun wine is, why there are so many different kinds of wine, how to enjoy it, all the lovely places it comes from, and so on. So I said, well, well, I could write that, I'd really love it. So Judy and I set off on our honeymoon, and, and it was sort of just after, um, and we toured all around Europe in the worst vintage of my life. 1965, <laughs> it rained everywhere, absolutely it rained. In Portugal, it rained in Germany, it just rained. Uh, however, I picked up a lot of material, I tasted a lot of wines, I met a lot of people, and I thought, yes, I've got the makings of a book. So I needed to find a publisher and, and an, oh no, no, I've got this in the wrong order. I needed the advance in order to go on this fancy honeymoon. So I asked a friend in, on the Sunday Times, I said, have you any idea of any publisher who'd be mug enough to give me an advance? Because I tried one or two and they said, what do you mean, an advance for a wine book? And they said, do you know about wine or don't you? Because you've got it. <laughs> um, however, he had a great idea because there was a, a food writer called Robert Carrier, who was actually an American, who was very, very popular, had a very good restaurant in London, and he had written the first coffee table cookery book, really, called Great Dishes of the World. And it sold, and everyone knew it sold. It was a smash hit. So I, um, my friend said, well, go to, go to Bob Carrier's publisher and say you want to do the wine equivalent. Yeah. Which is what I did, which is why it came out as a book with full color plates, pictures that I had to take myself. Um, and uh, and it, you know, in the, partly in the wake of Bob Carrier's book, it did astonishingly well. And uh, Simon and Schuster bought it in New York and away we go. I mean, that was the beginning really. Wow, what an incredible story. You know, when I think about food, a food book being an inspiration for you, it reminds me that 
a lot of people who love wine are people who love flavor and um, and are pretty good cooks. Are you are you a good cook? Oh, sorry, I missed that. Say are you a good cook? Good cook, no. I'm married to a very good. You know, why would I even try? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. so you're lucky then. Well, you know, many of us know you best, of course, for the World Atlas of Wine, um, which was the first book I was ever given, um, first wine book I was ever given. And, um, you know, I'm thinking it must have been a massive project because people forget that you're, you're trying to do research at a time before the internet, before, before there were even fax machines. If you were going to confirm a fact, oh. uh, you either had to be there or you had to place a phone call. I can illustrate your point because it was, um, we were uh, working very hard on the book in 1970. You know, it came out in 71, the beginning of 1971, I think. As you say, there were no, fa there, we didn't have fax machines. Everything was, went in the, in the post. And uh, I, we designed the book in the very ambitious way that anyone who's seen it knows it's extremely ambitious. The idea of having very detailed maps on the same page as a dry text, lots of captions to explain everything, lots of wine labels to give examples, which we now don't have in the eighth edition. Um, and I'd got to get all this material together. And I, I had to write to people and say, I want, I want your label, or I want a picture of your winery or something. And, uh, the, and they were, people, people were very cooperative. And I said, yes, he'd send it to you. Uh, and then we had a massive postal strike, a 10 week <laughs> postal strike. And the whole lot was in the post. And oh it was a most frustrating time I can remember. It really was. You know, all this uh, original material stuck. So things got a bit late, I will admit. <laughs> but we managed to hack it somehow. Um, I look goodness. back at that first edition and I can, you know, I can see the things that aren't there that should be there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that arrived by mail four months later. Oh my goodness. <laughs> how, how extraordinary. You know, Hugh, I often ask people um, about their most uh, memorable wine tasting. And I understand that, that you are one of the few people in the world to have tasted a wine from 1540. 1540, my goodness. Um, considered one of the oldest uh, wines to have ever been tasted. Um, is that your well, most memorable? Hmm? I mean, there's, there's no record of anything with a vintage attached, you know, a traceable right. wine. No, uh, and um, it was, it's a German wine. It came from Würzburg in Franconia. It was a Stein wine. I mean, in those days, the, the best vineyard of the, the Franken district in Würzburg is called, still called the Stein. It's a big, steep slope behind the town. And I reckon they just probably called their best wine Stein wine. But it was the vintage that was the thing. It was famously the hottest year ever in Germany. It was, they said that the river Rhine dried up. They said that builders had to use wine because there was no water, the mortar. Um, it was an absolute freak. So when there was a freak vintage, they used to make a special cask for it. And some of these were enormous great barrels. Uh, this one, there wasn't an awful lot of wine, so it was a a, a big barrel. I mean, as as big as some of the really big food as you see today. Um, and they obviously filled it up with the wine, and it was kept for the for parties and rather special occasions. But of course, once you started to uh, take take the wine out, the barrel wasn't full. So this was <coughs> this is why the wine was not. 1540. Its origin was, it was more like a Solera, frankly, I my belief. Ah. Because remember, they, didn't, they couldn't bottle it for about 200 years. And <laughs> wine bottles and corks were not even invented, not invented for another 200 right. years. So it oh. stayed in that barrel, or some of it did. And so what they used to do uh, was either to top up with another amazing sweet wine, it was obviously very sweet, 
or they used to drop pebbles or sort of stones in the, in the barrel to keep the level up. Um, and I've been to see the original cask, it's empty now, but it was apparently bottled in about 1740-ish, thereabouts, I think. And these, in those funny flasks that they use in Franconia, and uh, two of these survived. And um, there is still one, I've been to see the remaining one in this cellar in Würzburg, all cobwebbed up. I don't think it'll ever be open, probably. It's just a sort of, there's a shrine to it. Uh, but the previous one was it, bought by um, a German wine merchant in London. And he invited, there must have been maybe 10 or 12 of us, uh, to taste that and some other very old German wines. Uh, one morning in, I think it was 1963, and Andre Simon was there, and one or two other known white writers. I was there because I was on Vogue and Sunday Times and so on. Well, first we tasted two or three uh, Rhine wines. Uh, there were Johannes Berger something of about 200 years younger, or even, no, 300 years younger than the old one. And they were completely gone. I mean, you know how bad wine can be when it's, it's not just vinegar, it's actually horrible and rotten. And we thought, well, fat chance for the old one. And yet, when it was poured, each of us got a little, well, a tiny head cut, true, uh, worth, um, and um, they smelt it straight away, they were waiting. It was wine. I mean, it was, it was, it was warm and sweet smelling. Uh, it was utterly matterized. I mean, it was, it gone beyond Madeira, obviously, but there was something that made me think about Germany and it, you know, some aromatic, and uh, we tasted it and we were absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, and within, I should think, a minute, two minutes, it had turned to vinegar. You know, you had your sip, that was it. But that sip, when you think about it, was a liquid that had been, it would ripen by the sun of 1540. Unbelievable. Thank oh you. my God. Yeah. It gives me the chills. It's just such an extraordinary, I yeah. know. Oh, we love that about wine though, that it is a time capsule of, as people oh, have yes. said. A so, time and place capsule. Time and place capsule. Well, Hugh, thank you so much for uh, joining us from, from your home there in England. And, um, and thank all of you for, for listening. And our complete interview with Hugh Johnson uh, appears on winespeed.com's People to Know page. Um, please read it. I know you'll find it very special. Thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. I've certainly enjoyed talking to you, as I always do. So. <laughs> thank you, Hugh. So lovely to see you. Thank you. Good to see you.